Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Dr. Ross said, I was, uh, I was extremely impressed. I stepped in here. I, I was across, uh, across town over at the uh, Georgia Department of, of Transportation before this, and we were talking about some statewide planning for transportation. And I can't tell you, um, I'm not sure I've ever been in a group before where, you know, this, it wasn't a port-centric discussion. And uh, everybody was asking questions about the ports before I stepped up here, so I was, uh, it was uh, extremely pleasing and gratifying. So I hope that you'll uh, ask with equal enthusiasm me the questions uh, or similar questions after this. Okay, I have been asked in a very short 20 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes, to give you a quick update about our ports here in the state of Georgia. This isn't going to be a commercial. And I, too, uh, as one of the prior panelists pointed out, you know, the port business isn't a zero-sum game. I can tell you, in, and I've been in this on the private sector side for most of my career, uh, but for the last eight-plus years uh, here at the state of Georgia, and I spent a lot of time out amongst in Washington and at the national level promoting the need to improve our port system. And it's not about Georgia, it's not about South Carolina, Virginia, the state of Florida. It's about creating a transportation network that better serves the region. And it's the only way that we as a country are going to be able to support commerce as efficiently as we need to be. So um, as I go through this, I hope that is kind of clear. And I'd really never come across the term mega region before I was asked to speak to this group, but yet all we do in our marketing material is really talk about a mega region or the southeast as you'll see in the presentation. All right, so I'm going to talk about the GPA or the Georgia Ports Authority. We're a statewide authority. I'll take you through a little bit of that. Uh, economic impact of our ports, a regional gateway for trade, uh, some of the CapEx uh, uh, investments we're going to be making, infrastructure demands and needs, and then talk about uh, kind of our Achilles as a port and as a state, and that's really the, uh, the deepening of the Savannah River. All right, next. Okay, I mean, can, can all of you hear me? I feel kind of awkward standing behind a lectern here. It's a little easier for me out here. Okay, so as the ports, again, we're a statewide authority. And I think some of our neighboring states can kind of learn from that because we're able to pull together the resources of the, of the state and focus on focus all of them together versus what I see in some states around the country where you have different municipalities fighting each other. But we're responsible for managing, owning, and operating all the ports, international seaports of the state of Georgia. And these are the, the four different areas that they represent. Statewide impact of our ports, and I'm sure that in each of your areas you do the same sort of uh, comparison uh, from the state. Oh, okay, so we're doing this for the video. Sorry about that. Okay, so on a statewide standpoint, ports drive about 352,000 jobs a year. Uh, this isn't what we do. The state does a study every two years. That's data by about two years. And I think the other big uh, uh, item there is on your, floor, on your far right about $18.5 billion for, uh, of income for Georgians every year. Now, most importantly, uh, our ports are just a node for commerce and economic development throughout the state. Here are the, here's kind of how the, the distribution of those jobs ranks throughout the state of Georgia. So a lot of people historically would say, oh, it's the Port of Savannah or it's the Port of Brunswick or this is a, ports are a coastal issue. But I, as I was, I was mentioning to, uh, to Ken Stewart a little earlier, you might as well call us Port Atlanta or Port Macon or Port Augusta because everything that we do on the coast, and it, it's no different from any other port around the country, all you are, we're just a small funnel at the coast, but yet most of those jobs are going to large inland centers and the economic impact clearly doesn't stop here um, at the Georgia state lines. They trans transition throughout the, uh, the, throughout the entire southeast. But you can see in the Atlanta area, about 156,000 jobs are associated with port-related activity. Um, here are your top 10 ports in the country. Uh, this is just uh, it's factual statistical data. Now, this is based on containerized activity, not tonnage, but containerized throughput. 
And this is kind of a 10-year, it's a 10-year compounded annual growth rate comparison. But you can kind of see the top 10 ports in the country as they ranked in 2000, at the end of 2012, this is based on a calendar year. Uh, Los Angeles being the busiest port, Long Beach the second busiest. Really, the reality is those need to be captured as a single port, no different than the Port Authority in New York, New Jersey. So San Pedro Basin is is the lion's share of the activity coming into in, really into the United States. But you can see the size of them. Third busiest port complex in the United States are the combined ports of New York, New Jersey, handling about 5.5 .5 million TEUs in 2012. And then tiny little Savannah, or more importantly, let's call it the port or gateway port for the southeast, because that's really what's driven our growth, not Savannah, I can guarantee you that. About uh, 3 million TEUs. And on down the list, and I think the, uh, the real headline here, if you look at it for the last 10 years, our port has had the fastest growing compounded annual growth rate of any other port, kind of times two. So we've grown at about 8.5% on a compounded annual basis. Um, and really that kind of tracks demographic growth. There are really two reasons behind it. One, demographic strength of the southeast. Both manufacturing, retirees have, have drawn into the southeast. The most recent census supported that. One reason. Second reason, about a decade ago, the entire supply chain in the United States realized we couldn't continue to send all of the commerce that was being, the manufacturing that was being shifted to Asia, all of it could no longer continue to funnel through San Pedro Basin or Southern California to get to Atlanta, Nashville, Memphis, Greenville, South Carolina, Charlotte, and on and on. And so it's, uh, it's been a strong, uh, certainly a strong growth for us on, on, in, uh, in the southeast. All right, so I guess in that I've seen about 20 minutes of, of your discussion today, mega region. This is what the, this is what we always talk about is our, our service area as a port. So when we talk about serving commerce and trade, and we talk about building networks, and we talk about reaching out to Chamber of Commerce, and we talk about partnering with both of our Class One railroads, Norfolk Southern and CSX. These are the areas that we work hard to make sure that we can reach and service efficiently. That's why last year, the Chamber of Commerce in Memphis, Tennessee, sent a letter of support to Washington, D.C. about our deepening because they recognize how important our ports are and then the connectivity between our ports and getting to an area like, uh, like Memphis. In each of these areas that you see, um, the orange uh, points on there are served by both uh, Norfolk Southern and CSX. The black uh, areas by uh, Norfolk Southern and the green by CSX only. And why that's important is we have built our port network to service the southeast. We've worked very hard with, again, both CSX and Norfolk Southern to make sure that we are converting as much of that commerce to rail as we possibly can to lessen the demand on the highway system and to ultimately deliver a more efficient, more environmentally friendly, and more cost-effective solution for our customers. Um, just a, just a kind of expanding upon that, these are the areas that, uh, that are the highest in terms of our volume throughput through the port. So if you look at here, these are the top seven destinations or origins for trade that move through our ports. Uh, one of the other unique things about uh, our port in, in or at least, the, let's call it the southeast, the southeast is blessed to, to be a very balanced region. So when you think about trade in the U.S., imbalanced two to one, two imports for every export, generally in the southeast, we are one to one. Through Savannah, or through Georgia's ports, we're actually what we refer to as export dominance. We actually export more goods than we import. So as we think about rebuilding this country, the manufacturing base, improving the balance of trade we want to do everything we can in the southeast to make it as efficient as we possibly can. Uh, again, the rail connectivity piece, uh, this is the area that, that we're working every day. And you wouldn't think that uh, through the southeast you would be able to service Chicago very efficiently. And I'll just use that as a, as a, as a point of reference. Um, we are not a major port. I mean, we service Chicago very well. I won't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we're the primary gateway for Chicago. The Midwest is a huge, huge market. There's a lot that comes through uh, Southern California. There's a lot that comes through the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot that comes through New York, New Jersey. 
and the Port of Virginia is becoming a gateway into the Midwest. But for shipments that are coming from Asia through the Panama Canal, which today we receive 13 ships every week that are coming from Asia through the Panama Canal up the eastern seaboard, we are typically, and I'll kind of exclude in, in, in respect to the gentleman that was here from Florida, I think, earlier, and we can talk about that debate. But um, in Miami, we are typically the first port of call on ships that come up the East Coast on the all-water services through the Panama Canal. Well, if you discharge Chicago freight in Savannah, we can get that freight into Chicago faster and typically more cheaper than a route that's going through Virginia or into the Northeast. So it is about finding alternatives for more efficient commerce. And, and it needs to be multifaceted, I think, both East Coast, West Coast, and, and the Gulf. Um, it, you can see on the, on the, uh, on the vessel calls here, uh, just a, again, another kind of slide that indicates the port network up and down the East Coast. There are many ports. There are always going to be many ports. They're all very, very important. I can tell you that in the Southeast, we have lobbied in Congress several times when they try to bring up this debate, in particular with us between South Carolina and Georgia, the Georgia delegation has time and time again, including Governor Deal, including Governor Purdue before him. So we need all the capacity that ports in South Carolina and the ports in Georgia can build. Because the Southeast is only, and our customers ultimately trade and commerce is only going to be serviced as efficiently as it can if both ports are built out, if both ports are improved in terms of their access and efficiency. But what the East Coast has really become, and again, I'll kind of categorize it in this, and, and, uh, and I'll, I'm happy to, to discuss it more during a conversation later, is that there are, are three kind of primary gateways, and then there's South Florida. So you've got South Florida that's serving South Florida and Central Florida. And then you've got the Southeast Gateway. Savannah, is the, as you can see here with the number of ships, is the the gateway, the primary port in the southeast, not that the other ports aren't important. Then you've got Norfolk, Virginia, that serves the Mid-Atlantic. They're really exclusive in the Mid-Atlantic and have become a more important gateway into the Midwest. And then you've got New York, New Jersey, that is the northeast kind of gateway and is also offers good transportation solutions into the, to the uh, Midwest. What are we going to be doing over the next uh, 10 years? And I will tell you, every port authority in this country is different in their size, their shape, their makeup. So this is not a one-size-fits-all. But for us as a port, again, we are owned by the state of Georgia, but where we're different than most port authorities, we're an operating port. So we actually operate the facilities, and we don't fall underneath the state's budgeting process. So I'm not part of the state's budget. We're expected to be and operate with an entrepreneurial spirit. We're expected to go out and earn our own pay. We're not on the state's benefits program, so I'm not a state employee. Health care plan all, and all of our CapEx requirements are expected. We're, we're expected to service that debt, issue that debt, and pay for all of our CapEx needs. We will spend, as the Port Authority, not the no taxed money generated from our revenues, We'll spend $1.4 billion over the next 10 years investing into our ports for enhanced capacity, enhanced uh, mod modernizing our ports, and overall uh, velocity through our ports. Just a quick snapshot of that. And I, I'm, I'm, you're going to see a couple numbers here, but you can see that, that sub uh, 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 total down there, $1.4 billion. Again, that's the money we're generating. Far too much detail there, but we do have a complete 10-year plan that's been supported by our board. We update it every two years, but our latest uh, uh, investment is about $1.4 billion. Then you have another number right below that, $652 million. That is the cost of deepening the Savannah River to accommodate the modern ships of today. That's a shared uh, both state and federal expense. I'll, have, I'll talk about that at the end. That is kind of, as I mentioned earlier, that's our Achilles that we're working on now. We've dealt with almost everything else on the land side as well, if not better than any other, candidly, any other port in the country. But we've got to get deeper water to efficiently service the ship. So if you think about it in total, we'll be spending about $2 billion investing in kind of that port-centric infrastructure 
to better support commerce through the state of Georgia over the next uh, 10 years. All right, on the national level, this is something that I think everybody's dealing with, really in every store, every state in the in the uh, in the nation, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, by the way. Um, aging infrastructure, ports don't get attention that they need, nor that, that they deserve. It amazes me that we're in a in a country that talks about um, investing in the future, growing our exports, doubling our exports, making us more competitive. Well, travel to Singapore, travel to China, travel to Korea, go to Japan, go to Rotterdam, go to Germany. I will guarantee you, guarantee you, because I go to those places and have for decades, that over the last 10 years, they have less left us in their rearview mirror in terms of modernizing their port infrastructure, investing in their ports, bringing in automation, growing capacity, better road and rail access. They've done an outstanding job of it, and we have, as a, candidly, as a nation, are falling behind. Lack of capacity, there is no national strategy. There are several groups trying to work on one now, but I can tell you one doesn't exist today. It's kind of fend for yourself out there. How can we do that as a country if we expect to compete on a global uh, platform? And as I said earlier, our foreign trade partners are definitely uh, leaving us in their dust right now. Our issue on the local level, really, uh, because the state's done an outstanding job partnering with us to improve the road. In our, again, as I mentioned earlier, both CSX and Norfolk Southern have work, worked work with us hand in hand to improve the rail, and we've done the port component of it. But uh, our, uh, our Achilles or limiting factors are, are that federal channel, so it's not a state channel. It's not a Georgia Ports Authority river. It's a federal river that's got to be addressed. Quick update on, on this project. In technical terms, we received a record of decision, which is the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal uh, body that recommends the project, recommended it to Congress last October. This is dated now 13 months ago, October. State of Georgia's uh, already pre-funded almost all of their local sponsor share. They've funded $232 million up to this point. Uh, about another $30 million will complete the state's share of the total project. Um, we are certainly hopeful that in this upcoming fiscal year 15 federal budget, that the, since it's now looking at like it's going to finish its final federal hurdle, that there'll be some significant federal dollars. And that final hurdle is referred to as WERDA, Water Resources Development Act, and restructuring, I think it is, in Development Act. Um, passed the House on October 23rd. It, previously uh, came out of the Senate. It's now in conference. We hope that before the Thanksgiving break, it'll be, they will have reconciled their differences and it'll be going to the president for signature. That's the final hurdle on the, uh, on the authorization. Then we've just got to deal with the funding issue at the federal level. Here's what uh, the future kind of will bring uh, with and why there's so much interest in the Miamis and, and well, Norfolk's already got its deep water or raising the bridge and Bayonne Bridge up in New York, New Jersey is because ships are going to be larger coming to the eastern seaboard, period. Panama Canal is going to be expanded for the first time in 100 years. It was the locks that are operational in the Panama Canal today, if you haven't been there, were originally put in place in 1914. So August of 2014 will be the first, was, is the 100th year anniversary. We expect about six months after that to, to be, become operational. And the punchline is that ships three to four times the size that can currently call the, eastern, the east coast through the Panama Canal will be able to transit the Panama Canal. More efficient, tra larger ships translates into more efficiencies on a cost per unit basis, and they're more modern ships, so they're more environmentally friendly. I don't anticipate a tsunami of freight coming to the East Coast. Every port wants to stand up and say, we're going to double our capacity in the next 10 years. It's not going to happen. At least that's not what our customers tell us. There will be some marginal shift. The reality is we all need to be prepared to service that trade more efficiently, and that's what these everybody really needs to be talking about and get out of this this uh, this this uh, conversation about the uh, you know this again a tidal wave of commerce coming over. Uh, due to time, I'm going to skip that. I've talked about that. I think I'll uh, save the rest of my comments for uh, questions afterwards. Thank you.
Thank you, Curtis. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lewis Miller to you, who is the general manager of Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport, the busiest airport in the world. I can't imagine what his job must be like. Uh, he's been general manager since September of 2010, and during his tenure, he has um, oversaw the opening of the new Maynard Jackson International Terminal. And if you haven't been there, it's a pretty cool place. And prior to coming to Hartsfield, he was the CEO of the Tampa International Airport. Lewis? Thank you. Appreciate that very much. I have to follow Curtis, you know, and that's hard to do so, but I'll keep it, try to keep it going if I can. Is, the slide, is it up? There we go. I just want to talk a little bit about what Hartsfield Jackson is today. 920,000 total flights a year, think about that. That's 2,500 landings and takeoffs every day, you know. It's just a busy point of view. Average of 250,000 passengers a day coming through the airport. Gives you an idea of where we're at. Nonstop flights to 156 cities in the U.S. and 80 international cities in 50 countries. A 5.6 million square foot terminal facility with huge investment to get us to where we are today. But our biggest shortcoming is a 4,700 acre campus. And I say shortcoming because of our size. We're very, we're just locked in with freeways all around us and you can see where we're at. To put in comparison, as was mentioned, the busiest airport in the world, and yet Denver International Airport, for example, has 25,000 acres. DFW has 16,000 acres. Even with the airport I came from in Salt Lake City, we had 8,000 acres. So you can see what we happen to do here. So we have to really make sure we maximize our land value for what we have today and our development in the future. And I'll talk more about that as we move on. But that's kind of the largest shortcoming that the airport has, and it's a, it's a big one. If you look in terms of size, just from 10, 2010 to 2012, you can see what the growth has been from 89.3 million to 95.5 million passengers. You may read all these stories that are coming out from Beijing, China, I mentioned at our table over here. They say they're gonna pass us within the next year or two. We're, we're 95 million in 2012, they were 81 million. So they're still 20% behind us, somewhere to go. So, But you can see that happen in China. China will see some, some growth coming very quickly. But you can see what's happened here. We've been, we've been stable in our growth. Even during the worst economic downturns, we've seen some going forward that has been very positive. Now this year's kind of flattened out because of the economy and what that means for us, but you can see it's going forward. 9.9 .9 million of our passengers are international passengers. And the interesting thing, I'll talk more about it as well, is on, on freight. 60% uh, of our freight is international going out, which a lot of people don't realize. So you got that much air freight is going out, 60% international and 40% domestic. So you can see how important that is. Aircraft operations, you can see that bottom number, 994,000 operations in 2007, and yet in 2012, we were down to uh, 930,000. Now, that's a good thing. For us, that is fantastic. We got more passengers and fewer flights. And what it really means for the airport is the fact that like Delta and other major carriers are not flying so many small regional jets into the airport. They're replacing the regional jets with larger jets. So a 50 passenger regional jet takes the same amount of airspace, the same amount of runway as a 300 passenger 767. So you can just think about that. That one 767 will do as many, many, many passengers as six regional jets flying in and out of the airport. So it, make, it means a lot to us and what we see happening. Another good thing about our operations is Southwest acquisition of AirTran. That's gonna help as well because Southwest does not do the hub and spoke system like Delta does. They don't have the big peaks and valleys of flights throughout the day. They equalize them throughout the day. So they start in the morning and you'll see that happening in their schedules next month. So that gives us more airfield capacity because it's really important that we have that. So that's a good thing as well. This is just won't spend too much time here but just talking about annual revenues. You can look at the growth of what we've done at the airport. Our budget for fiscal 14 is $497 million annual revenues. I think I want to point out too, you see no tax dollars up there. Just as Curtis mentions, we do not get any local tax dollars. Nothing comes from state, uh, city, any area in here for tax money. It's all, we're an enterprise fund that we're self-sustaining as we move forward. 
So you can see where our revenues have grown from 394 million in 12 to 497 million, large increase in what we're doing. Most of that has to do with the new international terminal, some of the things that we've opened up. But another important number, if you look at the aeronautical revenues, that's basically the 210 million, that's what the airlines pay us. The non-aeronautical revenues is what we make from parking, concessions, food and beverage, merchandise, all the other things. And our goal is to keep the aeronautical revenues as low as possible, to keep the airline's cost per passenger as low as we can to stimulate more growth. So you can see 60% of our revenues come from non-aeronautical sources, which is really important. Now I'll go to the next slide. There it shows 497 million in revenue. Whoops. Our total expenses of 239 million. One person would say, well, what do you do with all that surplus revenue? You have all that, that money coming in. Well, we also had $3.4 billion in, in debt that we pay off, you know, in our, our long-term capital development programs. We borrowed general airport revenue bonds to, to fund that debt. And we, like I mentioned, no local tax dollars at all, so we have to fund that ourselves. Plus, we have about $100 million a year, $110 million every year with using operating surpluses to fund capital development programs. Curtis mentioned the size of the programs, and you'll see a little bit about ours in the future as well, but we're just finishing up. Uh, the last master plan was done in 1999, $5.6 billion in funding, which we have spent, and we're gonna do our new master plan. I'll show you more of that here in a minute, so you can see it's, we're continuing to grow. Just some overviews. I mentioned the $1.4 billion international terminal that's opened up. We connect to Concourse E, and the good thing about that is we now have a 40-gate international terminal complex at Hartfield-Jackson. And it's very important for us to have that because we want to make sure we can grow the airport and go into the future. So that is a good thing. We, we also have a, a 40 gates international. Our total gates are 215, so you can see how much international versus domestic gates. We have the retail outlets with, we have in the new in terminal. But we also, the most important thing it did is it eliminated the baggage recheck process. For those of you who flown, have flown internationally before, before we opened the facility, you had to come back, go through customs, immigration, all of that stuff, recheck your bag, go through security again, all of that, and then get back on the train and go to the main terminal, get your bag and leave. And it cost you about an hour and 15 minutes extra time in coming in. That's all been done away with. You get out of there and you save all that time going forward. So we're really pleased to see what that has helped us going forward. There's a little bit, we get a little, some concerns about the walk between E and F. The reason you have to make that walk between E and F is because you've now been, you've got to get to your bags before you get there and you can't be in the non-sterile part of the airport. So you have to stay under customs control. So that's why that works. But we've done some things to make it a little bit easier transition. But it's only a 13-minute walk. People say it's two hours, but it's 13 <laughs> minutes. And you get over there and here again. So that's 13 minutes versus an hour and 15 minutes when you had to go through the recheck facility. Mentioned the economic impact. If you look at the airport, now this is a study that was done in 2009. I wish we were doing this next month because we're updating that study this year in 2013. But it should be finished next month, so you'll see. $32.6 billion in the regional economic impact from Hartsfield-Jackson, 50, 58,000 jobs. That's within the fence line of Hartsfield-Jackson, 58,000 people working out there. Delta Airlines alone employs 29,000 people, just to give you an idea of the structure of what it's going, and are responsible for $16 billion in personal income. We know those numbers are going to grow significantly because we've opened the new international terminal and done a lot of things since 2009, so we look forward to seeing the new study. And if you look at what that means for jobs throughout the state, airport generated 150,000. All the way over to the end, if you, the, the related jobs, the visitor industry, for example, would not be what it is today if we didn't have Hartsfield-Jackson. That's what brings, allows all of the individuals to come here, conventions and things that happen. So you can just see it has an impact of about almost a half a million jobs in the state. And the interesting thing is this is where the people that work, this is a the redistribution of the 58,000 people that work at the airport, where they're coming from in different counties throughout the state, uh, in the, the metropolitan area around, around Atlanta. And you can see, obviously, the most are coming from South Fulton County and Clayton County and all the others, but it goes out. Actually, you see, outside of the U.S., 11% of the jobs. You'd wonder, what, why would people be outside the state somewhere and working here? 
if you think about it, it's a lot of the pilots, for example, on the flight attendants. They live somewhere else, but they're based here. So they're coming through here. But that has a, that just kind of shows your distribution of people. The other economic impact thing that's am amazing, and it's talking the stuff you were hitting on earlier on all the, the freight activity, 40% of the U.S. manufacturing and distribution is w within a 500 miles of Atlanta. So you think about what that means once the stuff, when Curtis gets his port deep, and then the stuff can come over here and either go out by air freight somewhere or it can be trucked somewhere to where it's going to go or on trains, because that's a good thing. And the other one that's important is 80% of the top 150 largest metropolitan areas in the United States are within a two-hour flight of Hartsfield-Jackson. And what that really means is people come in here I mentioned our total passengers of 95 million. 70% of those passengers never leave the airport. They come in and make a connection, so they come from, from Miami, and they go through Miami, and they come to Hartsfield-Jackson, and there they go somewhere and to another place, maybe in Seattle. But they make that connection. The good thing about that is, is that allows the airport to have, by having 70% of connecting passengers, Delta and the other carriers can continue to grow and not really only relying on their local economy. Now, what we have seen is the local origination destination passenger is growing faster as a percent-wise than the connecting, which is good. It shows what's happening in our community. But it's just a good thing to see that the growth we're having. <clears throat> as we prepare for the future, <clears throat> some of the things we're doing right now, you may have noticed it when you're out there, the vertical transportation system we're putting in. Remember, Hartsfield-Jackson now is 34 years old. It opened in 1980. So we're sitting here looking at the process of what do we got to do to make the airport functions well into the future. So we're doing some things like we're replacing 38 escalators, 45 elevators, and moving sidewalks. All of these things have to happen. Phase one is complete. We'll finish phase two in November of this month. It's in fact, to be finished by the end of the month. And then phase three will come forward and be finished by 2016. The one thing is we can't do it all at once. We have to phase it because we can't shut things down. We have to continue to operate. But just that project alone is $60 million almost. Cargo, the main, main thing for us to grow. I talked about air cargo being very important. You've heard about it here. I mentioned 60% of our cargo is international. But if you see 11 cargo, integrated cargo carriers come through Hartsfield-Jackson of the largest ones in the world. And so that's important for us to see as well. But if you said, who's the largest cargo carrier at Hartsfield-Jackson? The largest is actually Delta, believe it or not. And they have the majority of the cargo going to the international destination as well, because underneath that, in the belly of that airplane, there's a lot of cargo. It's not just your bags. It's a lot of cargo going out as well. So the largest is Delta, second largest is Federal Express, third largest is UPS. So you can just see from those cargo carriers, or from the carriers, what it means for us. So we want to make sure we grow and can meet the future needs of cargo. We're going to add another 100,000 square foot cargo facility, which should open by the end of next year. It's under design as we speak. And it'll actually do a $40 million investment to make this happen, but it's going to allow us to continue to grow. And going back to what Curtis is talking about, we're going to see more and more of when the port finishes, a lot of that stuff that's going to be in the Port of Savannah is smaller products that's going to be shipped all over the world by air freight. So you'll see, and that's why we want to make sure the road system coming over and the trains and everything work well, so it's good for us. Inbound roadway system, this, I won't get into too much detail here, but we're changing the inbound roadways. You've seen a little of that when you've been driving out at the airport. It's about a $63 million project. It's going to be finished in January of 2015. So we got uh, another little over a year to go. You haven't seen any major impact yet, but on December 4th, of this year, I believe this shows it, you're going to see the first major road change coming into the airport. As you're coming in from I-85, right now you circle around that lower area down there where the, the taxi cab staging area is. You're going to go further to the south and circle around and come back so we can redo all of the road system when it comes in. There will be plenty of signs to show you where to go, but when this is finished, it'll be a much more efficient way coming into the airport. Because right now we have too many weaves and too many lane changes as you're moving forward. So here again, the road system was built back in 1980. We've just got to do a major, major renovation to it. And that's about a $60 million project that's happening now. Concourse C midpoint is going to be expanded. Uh, some of you may have seen Concourse D midpoint expansion we've already finished. But here again, Concourse C and D were not as, didn't have the major midpoints like Concourse A, B, and T, the concourses that we originally built. So this is going to really help 
more food and beverage, but more importantly, vertical circulation. If you've come in on C or D before, you've had to wait to go down escalators or elevators, that will go away. It makes it much more efficient for us as well. It's about another $51 million. Uh, A380, you may have read about this, where the A380 started operation here. That's the largest air airplane in the world. Korean Air started flying this in here at, uh, be towards the end of September, beginning of October. And that plane comes in, we had to spend about $20 million in making facility improvements just to handle that airplane. You notice how wide the wings are and how far out the engines sit. We had to widen taxiway shoulders and shoulders around the runway so it wouldn't blow up debris when it's flying. So, and ha all obviously, when it's that, it takes two gates and not one. And it also has to have a, a second, a loading bridge that goes to the second level because you board from the upper level on the lower level. So that's been finished and it's operating very efficiently as we speak. So our master plan from 1999 included, I mentioned earlier, $6.4 billion worth of projects. I'm not going to go through all of those, but most, a lot of them are listed up there. The big ones were the new runway, the international terminal, and the consolidated rental car facility. And now we're going to start updating our master plan going forward. And we call it to actually navigate to 2020. The study started in 2012. We've already completed our FAA forecast of, of passenger demand. The FAA has approved these forecasts. We accept, think we'll be at uh, 120 million passengers per year by the year 2031. So you can see that kind of growth coming. A million to 75,000 operations per year. So what we've got to do is make sure we plan for the future. And that's what we're doing as we speak. So a lot of you, you read about it. We, we know where our shortcomings are, but our facility requirements are being defined right now, and we should have those this plan should be finished by the first quarter of, of next year in 2014. So at that point in time, I'd love to cut, talk to you again and show you what our program is going to be. But we know we're going to have to have new gates. We know at some point in time we're going to have to have a sixth runway. We have five runways today. Someday we're going to have to have six. We're going to have to make sure we're prepared for that into the future so we can handle those 120 million passengers as efficiently as we are doing that today. So. Sustainability is very important to us. I won't spend much time on, on this, but we want to make sure we, we want a better buildings challenge. International Terminal was a gold certified, LEED certified facility, so we just want to be sure we continue to meet those things well into the future. One of the good things is Mayor Reed, who we're part of the city, is very, very strong on making sure you do sustainability things, at, not only at the airport, but throughout the city. And he's very strong on cargo, so those are the two areas that we're really pushing for. But he does it for the right reasons. I know I was talking with, with Curtis and what he's done to try to lead the, the, the band on the deepening of the Port of Savannah. He's been very, very, very helpful in that because he looks at a broader picture of what he's doing. And you've probably seen when he got reelected with 85% of the vote last night. So obviously he's a very popular man. And I think that's it. Well, I might have missed one, but we're okay. Anyway, thank you all very much, and we'll take your questions now. Microphone, thank you. Thank you, uh, Curtis. Well, both of you, Lewis and Curtis, thank you so much for being here for what you do. And we brag a lot about Georgia, and it always seems to go back to the things that you two do. So <laughs> uh, it's it's a big economic driver. As I look, Curtis, at your charts, there were 14 million TEUs out of uh, the two southeast or uh, Southern California ports. And I don't recall what the numbers were other than ours. I think yours were 3 million, roughly. And I know the, the uh, Panama Canal is coming along here pretty quick. And, and you said not to, to do a lot of hoping that there'd be a big change in any respect. But thinking long term, uh, that's a big difference between 14 million and, pro and certainly three. What are the confluence of things that are going to happen, are going to need to happen? That, so we're not going to be seeing things coming all the way across the country like they were before because it's got to be a lot more efficient to bring it in by ship. Uh, I mean, Ken, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's a great point. First, a couple of uh, kind of uh, data points that I think are important to understand. 70% um, of the U.S. population lives in the eastern one-third of the United States. Okay? So two-thirds of the population is in the eastern one-third of the U.S. So a lot of this commerce and cargo that's still coming through Southern California is being transported all the way across the country to these people. Um, undebatable fact, if you're transporting goods around the world, 
the most efficient per unit transport. It starts with ships. So get those ships as close to the destination or user as you can. Then the next most efficient are trains. The next most efficient are trucks. And the third is air, and maybe the next or fourth is air, maybe the fifth would be on a person's back. But so think of it that way. And um, so, so what's going to happen? I mean, it's, it's been, I, I bet I, I speak on this 50 times a year for the last five years. What's going to happen post the Panama Canal expansion? It's hard to envision a scenario, certain people debated, but it's hard to envision a scenario where if you significantly improve the economies of scale coming to the East Coast from where most of the goods are being both manufactured today and the goods that we produce in the U.S., folks, typically aren't manufactured high-end goods. They're raw materials or semi-finished goods that, oh, by the way, are going to Asia to be a part of that manufacturing to come back to us. It's hard to envision that as the economies of scale improve by 20 to 30 percent coming to the East Coast, that some of that transportation that's going through Southern California, you can take advantage of that and come to the East Coast. So I think on any, any kind of reasonable forecast, you're going to have growth coming to the Eastern Seaboard. So we need to prepare for it. That doesn't mean that Southern California is going to be marginalized, but there's going to be more need on the Eastern Seaboard. We've got to have deeper harbors, a.k.a. us, Charleston, Miami's working on it now, New York, Virginia. Not everybody can. Everybody wants to, but the nation can't afford to it. We've got to have better access to the ports, both road and rail. And we've got to have unlimited bridge clearance issues, and really the, the, the major one today that's being dealt with is in New York. And that's where when we talk to, at the national or federal level, Ken, what we're trying to do is say, listen, we know you can't deal with the, 200 ports in the U.S. that everybody wants to be a winner. Um, you gotta, you got to start somewhere, and what I've kind of argued on the container side of the business, and by the way, you have to do the same thing for dry bulk, and you have to do the same thing for crews, and you have to, but on, on the container side of the business, which is kind of what we're talking about right now, um, let's start at least with the top 10 ports in the nation, and let's make sure that they have great rail access, that they have great road access, that they have room to grow their ports, they have good water access, and they have no bridge clearance issues. So that kind of be my takeaway that would say those are the things we need to do. I will tell you candidly, Georgia's done all that that they can control, and the one thing we're missing is, is the water here in Georgia, if that answers the question. Hi, my name is Arthur Wendell. I'm with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I appreciate uh, all your all your talks today. I've got a comment and a question. The first comment is uh, for Lewis. And 15 minute walk after nine hours on a flight sounds like from a public health side of things a, a good thing to do. All right, thank you. Why don't you publish that? <laughs> well, the second question is uh, is is for Curtis. And um, you know. Uh, when I was, I went to Savannah about a year ago, and I w visited a, a train museum there. And one of the things that they built over a hundred years ago was a tall chimney to kind of take away some of the, the coal emissions and blow it out away from populated areas. And looking at Savannah, um, you know, a lot of, at least from my brief perspective, you know, the, the harbor and the port, um, with the prevailing winds, it blows out over unpopulated areas and then out over the ocean. Uh, one of the challenges for ports is is that pollution exposure. And can you talk a little bit about potentially advantages that, um, or does that come into play uh, with the you know potentially less exposure to populations from uh, port-related emissions um, in some ports versus others? I mean, it's a it's a great question. I think anybody in this business today that isn't focused on uh, uh, doing more with less from an environmental sustainability standpoint is uh, uh, they're ignoring the facts that exist today. Um, we happen to be blessed where we're located in Savannah with, again, the prevailing winds that blow things out overseas. It doesn't mean they're going away, but they're blowing them out. But we uh, embarked as a port, and as a, as a port authority, we embarked about five years ago on a uh, what I would submit to you is the most stringent and committed environmental uh, sustainability plan of any port on the East Coast and the Gulf. Now, I, I'm, I am out of respect for our ports on the West Coast, it's hard to compare 
us in this eastern side to them because they've had such large mandated regulations that have forced some enhancements. We have electrified our cranes, electrified container and equipment. We're working on LNG trucks. We've reduced, coming out of Atlanta, I used to I fly it all the time. The, the pilots used to joke, and it, was, it wasn't a joke, that the minute they got to about 10,000 foot elevation coming out of Atlanta here, there was a light beacon in Savannah, and it was our port that showed them where they needed to go. Well, we've, we've changed that, I can tell you that for sure. Just in what we've done in the last five years, we've eliminated in perpetuity about uh, four and a half million gallons of diesel that's burned every year or consumed inside of our port. We just need to do more of that. We've got to do everything we can to improve uh, kind of our platform. I've touched on a, on a little bit of it. Again, we're in a, in, in a and, and I, the, the kind of the punchline there, and again, respect to our friends on the West Coast, we've done all that without a single mandate. Not one thing that we've done has been mandated by the local community, by the state of Georgia, or by the federal government. But it's something that we've taken the initiative to be res a responsible uh, community leader. And I'll add to that, we're doing the same thing at Hartsfield Jackson. We've converted our shuttle buses, 46 of them have been converted to compressed natural gas. We're putting in electric vehicles charging stations. We're convincing the airlines that they should use electric vehicles, tugs, for driving around on the ramp to keep things going. So we're going to do everything we can to be as sustainable as possible and protect the environment. And the same with Curtis. We're not mandated to do this. It's just the right thing to do. Um, this uh, question is for, for Lewis. Um, I'm trying to think of Hartsfield in terms of um, uh, the mega region. And uh, um, when you talked about the passenger travel, you said it was like 70% is passed through. Going, it, what, what, is it similar on the freight side? Like are, are things being consolidated from other flights and coming in or is it, is it all kind of loading up at? at no, it's airport? very similar on the freight side because like with Delta, the same thing. The international traffic is coming in here and then being taken out. So with Delta, yes, it's very similar. With the other carriers, with the international all cargo, all cargo carriers, it's not. They're flying the cargo into here or flying it out. And as I mentioned, they are, as our, you know, 40% or 60% is the international. Most of that is making connections on Delta's flight, but the rest of it is not, that's going directly out. So you'll see that continue to happen because here again, the airlines can't afford to just be in a market and, put, and only be able to put half of the cargo on an airplane. They want to fill that plane. And the best way to fill it is to have a major hub like you have here in Atlanta where they can bring in the transfer cargo as well as the origination destination. Um, Curtis Madhauser, um, with global warming and rising seas and such, uh, you talked a lot about your capital improvement program. Going forward, are you all planning for hardening the port and, and dealing with those sorts of issues? Um, I think yes. All right, but that's a uh, it's a very uh, it's a very challenging question to, uh, to 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 ask. You know, I think our port, when we look out for the next fifty to a hundred years, um, I think we've taken most of that into consideration. Uh, but at, uh, I think we need to do that every four or five years to make sure that we're keeping up with it. But but I think for the most part, yes. The answer, short answer to it. Um, this question is for Lewis. I was wondering what your perspective is um, on the role of airports within mega regions and freight. Clearly, there's a very strong role, but a how do you? What's the different scales that need to be involved? Given that Atlanta is so big, and there's lots of other cities in the mega region that are smaller, and what's the best way for airports to work with MPOs and state DOTs and some of the other partners in this? Well, I think well, we have a very good relationship with the ARC. We work very closely with them. We worked with other MPOs as well. In fact, it's interesting. When I was in Tampa, Florida, the airport director there, I actually served on the MPO. So I think having an active involvement with the Metropolitan Planning Organization is very, very important because it's not only what's coming in and out of the airport, it's how do you get to the airport, the highway system and the road system and the train system coming in. So I think the airport should pay a key, play a key role in any regional development that takes place, whether it's just in within the Atlanta area or in the mega region, what you're, which you're talking about here. And that's why I mentioned before with Mayor Reed so actively involved in what's happening in Savannah. 
we got to look at the entire state of Georgia as that, that being the mega region we're focusing on. Curtis, uh, t talk a little bit about, I know there's been a lot of interaction between Georgia and South Carolina on ports, uh, Savannah, Charleston, Jasper. Just talk a little bit about the relationship and where things stand there. You want me to talk about the good part or the bad part, Dave? What do you, no, it's, it's all, all kidding, all kidding. For my friends from South Carolina that may be in the room. Um, we have, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in Georgia we do not see it as a zero-sum game. I truly believe, I have argued with the American Association of Port Authorities, I've, I have uh, submitted this to the South Carolina delegation, we've had uh, the Georgia uh, General Assembly pass legislation that says we are supportive of Savannah's deepening and we're supportive of Charleston's deepening. Because both states, the region, only wins if both of our ports can efficiently handle commerce, period. There hasn't been that same sort of commitment coming from our friends in South Carolina. I know that Governor Haley is fully supportive of it. Well, I know that one of the things that we have tried to come together and work on, and Dave referenced it, is that there is a 13,000-acre uh, tract of land that's on the Savannah River that's in the state of South Carolina, that's owned by the state of Georgia. So you should figure that one out. Um, we have come together. Uh, it was under two prior governors and both current governors support it. Uh, we, the state of Georgia, have transferred about 2,000 acres of that, a little less than that, uh, into a, call it a holding company that's a joint group represented by South Carolina and Georgia that are going to try to develop a joint port to service the region's needs after the current port's capacities in South Carolina and Georgia are maximized out. We forecast that to be at 2030, 2035, something like that. This port would take 15 to 20 years to develop that. We're trying to get that done. Uh, but it's been a little complicated and a little more prob problematic than it should be. Uh, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it because again, the mega region that's represented by the southeast that today is about 45 percent of the u.s population that will probably grow to close to 50 percent of the population because of the manufacturing shift to the southeast and the demographic shift of, of just the, the with the quality of life to the southeast the region's going to need to have that sort of capacity coming in there so that's a without a it take an hour to take you through all the <laughs> curves and bends in it Marshall Farmer with Regional Planning Commissioner of Greater Birmingham. I was wondering if you have any um, forecast for the number of additional containers that are going to be fed into the land side freight network after they come in the post Panamax world? Yes, sir, we do. Um, we have uh, we've uh, supplied that to Georgia DOT as well as the governor's office and all that. Um, We've, uh, we're currently working on an updated forecast. We do, we run on a 10-year planning cycle. Um, we're currently doing our 2024 plan. Uh, so it'll include both pre and post the canal expansion. And it includes a split a, as best as we can forecast it, a split between rail transport and road transport. So we've, uh, we've got those numbers and uh, they're as accurate as the 10-year forecast will provide. But yeah, I think we're I think honestly and candidly, I mean, we've got pretty good data points, uh, you know, go back 20 years, we can calculate it going forward, and we've got demographic growth and market forecasts. I think it's fair, relatively accurate, where you can identify those uh, flashing red points that are going to occur over the next uh, decade or two. One more question. By the way, Birmingham's a big market for us also. I, I wanted to ask a question. Um, is my mic on? Okay, good. I wanted to ask a question about air cargo. Um, the type of air cargo that comes <laughs> that's coming into Atlanta, is it diversified? Um, obviously, it's a different type of cargo that then can be on rail or truck. I know, I think Miami has a huge flower, you know, coming in from Columbia. Obviously, that, that's time sensitive. So, can you just speak to a little bit about the type of car, air cargo that's, that's coming in and out of Atlanta? 
obviously it's very, very di diversified because that's what it means coming in and going out. And so it's, it's diversified in that we do get some of the plants. We're gonna, in fact, tomorrow we're going to open up the new uh, facility to handle more uh, cooling of stuff when it gets here so <clears throat> we can make sure we have the right facilities that we need to move forward. So the USDA is moving forward with the project for that. So it's pretty diversified. A lot of auto parts are coming in now with what's happening in the area. Obviously, when Porsche opens our new facility, we'll see more of that happening as well. But it's a, it's a small type freight. It's not large stuff because people can't afford to put you know, large stuff on airplanes coming in. Although we do get cars shipped in here. Believe it or not, people actually ship a car <laughs> and fly it in here so they can get it in a hurry. Daryl, one last question, and I think we will thank our panelists. You've done a lot of talking about the East Coast ports, but I haven't heard you anybody mention anything about the Gulf um, Coast ports, you know, Mobile, um, Houston, you know, New Orleans. How does that, how's that figuring in with what you guys are looking at as far as, you know, freight movements, you know, coming from the, the Gulf side? Well, it's, I mean, it's a great question. I, uh, I've worked in New Orleans, so I know it well, and on the private sector side, kind of oversaw the Gulf. Uh, the reality is, if you, um, if you kind of map out global shipping trade lanes, it's hard to get in the Gulf. So the big, major, transatlantic, transpacific, major trades, very few of them go into the Gulf. It's, a, it's, a, it's hard to get in there. Uh, you can serve that market relatively well from the West Coast, or from the East Coast, so it's a, uh, it's somewhat limited, and I'm not downplaying it. Uh, Houston, Houston's going to be the dominant player in the Gulf for for probably in perpetuity. Uh, doesn't mean that Mobile goes away. It doesn't mean the Gulfport goes away, or Tampa goes away, or New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans will continue to be a big play, in particular with the ag market coming out of the Midwest. But it's dry bulk and agri bulk ag, ag products. But uh, uh, it's just a uh, it's. A, Unless you're coming from the Gulf Coast of Mexico or from Central America, the Gulf's a hard place to get from the major trade lanes. Great. Well, join me in thanking our outstanding panelists again.